Hi everyone. Thank you for joining me today for the latest installment of my weekly teachings. Before we get started, a couple of reminders. First, click the subscribe button on the screen if you'd like to stay connected to this channel for future teachings. Also, if you find value in this program, please give us a thumbs up. If you scroll down to the description box on the page below, that's where you'll find the links to all of my social media sites, as well as the link to my blog, My Daily Letters, where I post the prophetic words that I receive from the Lord. Well, I think that's it on the reminders. So let's get started with today's teaching entitled Gratitude, the Bedrock of Holiness. Now, as I was sitting with the Lord in preparation for this teaching, he said two things to me. First, I heard the word gratitude, and then he said, pursue holiness. He then showed me that in the life of the believer, these two are linked. In, in 1 Peter 1, it says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. We understand then that holiness signifies a separation from the unholy or profane. The Lord wants us to be set apart avoiding the behaviors we practiced before accepting Christ. But how is gratitude defined? Well, in the scriptures, the Greek term for gratitude is described as the quality of showing appreciation and a returning of kindness. Gratitude is, by definition, more than just being thankful, as thankfulness is a basic acknowledgement when a gift is received or when something good happens in our life. We can say thank you to be polite, but this doesn't necessarily express gratitude. For there's a reciprocal quality to genuine gratitude that goes beyond thankfulness, where we respond to God's goodness with a desire to return the kindness we were shown. We do this by living a life that is pleasing to him which is pursuing holiness, the act of endeavoring to live a life set apart from the ways of this world. If you and I were talking, you might consider gratitude as a term of action, but it is actually a noun. Even though we understand a noun to be a person, place, or thing, it can also be a state of existence. Now the dictionary definition of gratitude says, that it is the state of being grateful. Gratitude is intended to occupy a position within our heart or our very being. It is the motivator that governs our action. If I'm grateful, its attributes, the very nature of gratitude, will be expressed through my behavior. I can say I am grateful, but it's through my actions that gratitude is seen. Just like the expression that says, actions speak louder than words, we as believers testify to our belief by our behavior, oftentimes more so than with our confessions of faith. So in a nutshell, when we hold genuine gratitude towards the Lord, it will always lead to the pursuit of holiness or a life that is set apart for him. The Lord then showed me that one of the main reasons that holiness is absent in the church today is because most believers lack a sense of gratitude, genuine gratitude. And what has replaced it is an attitude of entitlement, an attitude found in the world that has infiltrated the church, having been reinforced by the seeker-sensitive ideology, which is hyper-focused on the gift of grace. This in turn leads to a form of idolatry as the gift of grace is then elevated above the giver who is God himself. 
When we accept Christ as Savior, we enter into a covenant of grace with the Lord. That's true. This is an undeserved gift, something we do not earn, but is freely given to us. However, because an overemphasis has been placed on grace instead of holiness, a common idea running through the church is that grace is like a free pass that entitles believers to engage in sinful behavior without consequence. I can do what I want, dress how I want, behave how I want, talk how I want, because I'm under grace. Basically, abuse the liberties we as believers have in Christ. The giver of the gift, God himself, is then only there to solve our problems and bless our choices. And since the true magnitude of the gift of grace has been diluted, genuine heartfelt gratitude is non-existent. Oh, sure, there may be thankfulness when a prayer is answered or when unwanted circumstances turn favorable, but the Lord showed me that a believer in this mindset is only paying him lip service, that there is no depth to their verbal expressions because the real value of what has been given was missed. What I saw was this, that gratitude needs a basis to exist or a foundation to build upon. It is something that doesn't automatically find a home in our heart. It needs a causation to thrive. But when the message of the cross has been watered down to accommodate the sinful habits of the unsaved, genu genuine gratitude is not given a reason to manifest. This is the danger when the full gospel message is not taught. When parts that might be offensive or off-putting are intentionally left out, there is no way to encounter its transformational truth. We often hear this quote from Ephesians that says, we are sinners saved by grace. And while that is true, this fragment of scripture does not embody the whole truth about the covenant of grace, which says, God in his great love intervened on our behalf and saved us from our depraved state with the gift of undeserved grace. Gratitude doesn't just focus on the gift that was given, but it recognizes the undeserved nature of the gift. It understands that we are indebted to God for what he has done for us and humbly bows to his lordship with a sense of reverence and awe. In Romans 5, it says that one sin brought death to many others, yet in an even greater way, Jesus Christ alone brought God's gift of undeserved grace to many people. The Lord reminded me of the story of Israel's journey to the promised land, and he said this, conditional gratitude. And what he meant was that their gratitude only existed based on them experiencing favorable circumstances. And he drew a parallel between the attitude of the ancient Israelites and the Christian church of today. Now we know that in the story of the Exodus, that God sends Moses back to Egypt at his, as his representative to free the Israelites from bondage. He promises to not only set Israel free, from their captivity, but also lead them into the land of their inheritance. Before they experienced freedom, the Israelites saw God rain down judgment upon Egypt with several different plagues, but their own lives were virtually untouched. And when Pharaoh finally relented and let God's people go, not only were they no longer slaves, but they received the spoils of Egypt. God intervened on their behalf not because they deserved it, but because his goodness came to their aid. Just as he has done for you and I through Christ, we are saved not because we have earned salvation, but because of God's love for humanity. As it says in 1 John 4, we love because he first loved us. However, just as it was with the Israelites, as we find out later in the story, God's redemption for some is not enough to garner genuine gratitude in their hearts. Now, as we continue on with Exodus in chapter 14, 
Well, on the way to the promised land, the Lord had the Israelites camp by the Red Sea, which when Pharaoh had a change of heart and pursued the Israelites, left them with literally nowhere to run. But the Lord does the miraculous in their midst by parting the Red Sea, delivering them again from their enemy. Their thankfulness for this deliverance is expressed through Moses and Miriam's songs. But it's short-lived. As the grumbling begins when God tests them with the problem of no water to drink, as it's described in Exodus 15, 24. They were thankful to be set free, but gratitude had not truly taken, taken root. Like us, the Israelites probably had expectations about what their journey with the Lord would look like, which did not match reality. Unexpected obstacles challenged their narrative, bringing out the true condition of their hearts. Uh, this is what God so often does with us. He intentionally positions us to encounter adversity in order to reveal those negative attitudes that still need to change. When we grumble and complain at the, at the Lord over the adversity we are facing, it speaks to an entitled attitude that says, this isn't what I signed on for, or I shouldn't have to go through this, exposing the absence of gratitude. And so like the Israelites, what I saw happening in the church with quite a few believers is that they are thankful as long as things are going their way. When we are truly grateful to the Lord, this internal posture does not change no matter what issues we face. Outward stressors don't impact our attitude towards the Lord. There, now there's another aspect of gratitude that you might not know, that gratitude is actually a stance of warfare. So let me explain. When we assume the posture of gratitude, our thoughts dwell on who God is which lifts our perspective off our circumstances. What does this do? If I'm in, a const, in constant awareness of the Lord and I continually remind myself of what he's done for me, it brings about a sense of unshakable trust in him. And because I've set the Lord before me, when adversity comes along, I don't view it with negativity. As it says in Psalm 16:8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. So then gratitude is not a passive position, but an active one. Because we are continually engaging the Lord with a grateful heart. Or as some have said, we are cultivating gratitude in our lives. We can see in um, the Israelites' continuing journey towards Canaan in Exodus 16, that the Lord tests them again. This time the issue is no food. So even though the Lord has already proven himself to be trustworthy, they still grumbled. In verse three, it says, the Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Even though they were enslaved, there was still a sense of comfort in the life they had known in Egypt. So again, we see that the Israelites are addressing this new challenge with their preconceived ideas of what their relationship with God would look like. Namely, that God was there to make their lives easier by solving their problems. An important point to, uh, to embrace is that genuine gratitude accepts the good with the bad. It remains open to what the Lord is doing in life, even if that means facing repeated testing. Now, I know from personal experience that it's easy to be grateful when things are going well, but it's much more of a challenge when they aren't, which is why we must press back against adversity with gratitude. We must also be aware that there is a danger when our gratitude towards God, the giver, is conditional. Because expectation 
then becomes a demand for him to make our lives better. The meaning of which is subjective to our own definition. So when God doesn't come through as we had anticipated, we think we're entitled to complain. And when we grumble, we are taking the gifts that God has already given us for granted, forgetting what it says in Romans 8:28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Looking back once again at, the Isra at, at Israel, we see that when they finally reach a temporary resting place at Mount Sinai, where they had to receive the Ten Commandments, the Lord calls Moses to ascend the mountain for further instructions. It is then that the true extent of what's in Israelite, the Israelites' hearts is manifest. Exodus 32, 1 says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Because the Israelites didn't know if Moses would return, they took matters into their own hands and had Aaron make a false god for them to worship. Now, though they were in the dark as to what had happened to Moses, yet because they had not cultivated gratitude by reminding themselves of what God had already done, uh, they rebelled by reverting back to the sinful practices they had learned in Egypt. Let's take this lesson and apply it to ourselves. At times when we are waiting on the Lord, where he seems distant or unresponsive, we must guard our hearts by cultivating gratitude in our hearts, blocking the temptation of falling back into sin. We must remember that when gratitude is absent from our lives, so is the reason to remain faithful which makes it easy to slide back into worldliness, running back into the life we used to know. It is for that reason that we must be intentional about cultivating gratitude in our own lives by continually reminding ourselves of not only who God is, but what he's already done for us. The Lord did this throughout the history of the Israelites, where he would have them erect physical memorials to remind them of the many victories they had received at, by his hand. Now in my life, I received a digital photo frame this year for Mother's Day. Uh, anyone in my family can upload pictures to remind me of each of those joyful moments in our lives, which in turn generates in my heart a sense of gratefulness to the Lord for the blessing that is my family. Cultivating gratitude by reliving not only the good things he has done for us, but just how awesome God truly is will never leave us wanting. Let us always remember that God's desire is that we desire him, the giver, not just the gifts. He is looking for a people who are after a true relationship with him, one that is reciprocal in nature a relationship that isn't based on what they can get from God, but that longs to be with him because of who he is and what he's already done. He desires a people whose hearts are so filled with gratitude that they only want to live a life that is pleasing to him, one that pursues holiness because he is holy. Now, as is often typical in my relationship with the Lord, he usually gives me a letter about whatever topic he's talking to me about. And he's done that for this teaching as well, which he asked me to read to you. So this is what I heard. The right to be called sons and daughters of God is not accomplished on one's own merit or by heredity, but through the will of God. Then who can say of themselves they deserve to bear this title? 
as it is only through my grace alone that any have, have attained this noble station. So while a great price was paid to gain this privilege of adoption into my fold, still few are they that express genuine gratitude for this undeserved and costly gift, as their lives still reflect their old nature. For those who are genuinely grateful are easy to distinguish from the rest, as the pursuit of holiness marks their path. These do not consider their redemption as a small matter, and so seek to live a life worthy of being called my son or daughter. And while many are happy to be saved, still their gratitude is conditional, for it does not originate in their hearts and is based upon what I can do for them. And so it is gone as quickly as it came, lasting for a fleeting moment and this, then disappearing as if it had wings. Though these have every reason to walk in a constant state of gratitude, yet have they allowed selfish expectations to determine its appearance. For unless their demands are met, any ounce of gratitude is withheld, as if their poor attitude might move me to act. So much like petulant children do these stand. Oh, how easily they have forgotten from whence they came, and the eternally and eternal suffering they surely would have known if I had not intervened. Do they not recall just how pitiful was their condition before encountering my generous offer of salvation? Yet to get their foot in heaven's door seems to be all these ungrateful children were after. For now their life, they, they live much as before, chasing after the desires of their flesh instead of actively pursuing holiness. As such does my body, also referred to as the church, look and act like the world. For there is little evidence in the physical sense to distinguish the lost from the saved. Ah, but did I not say those who belong to me are a peculiar people, set apart as my possessions, as those grafted into my line? Then their lives should speak to this elevated stature, where they endeavor to live as did my son, who only ever sought to please the Father. For surely did he endure the cross as an act of complete surrender to my will, a gift of selfless love which entitles the sinner and the scoffer to be called sons and daughters. And while there is much liberty allotted to those that are redeemed, for the penalty of sin is no longer held against them, still are there natural consequences for their sinfulness, as the gift of grace does not prevent this from occurring. None can avoid the negative impact which a continuing partnership with sin shall have upon their lives, for sooner or later its damaging effects shall take its inevitable toll. As such, those who remain on iniquity's path do so at their own peril, as many are those who, upon hearing my instructions to pursue holiness, did not heed my words and have sadly slidden back into the pit, for they could not remember any reason to stay, to stay faithful, as the blessing of salvation was not enough to garner genuine gratitude in their hearts. See then, I have come in this hour to reaffirm this high standard of holiness in the lives of my children, where they are, where they are to set aside their old manner of living in exchange for my holy living, that pursuit of a holy lifestyle that is fitting for those known as my sons and daughters. Therefore, no longer conform to the ways of this world and stop making allowances for sinfulness to dwell among you. For I have said, and so I shall say it again, lest any of you forget, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Thank you again for joining me today.